So today's workshop is going to be on organic slash sustainable disease control. And this is a really tough road for farmers and backyard gardeners to hoe because diseases are incredibly dynamic. They're very hard to predict. Sometimes they're very, very heartbreakingly predictable on the other hand, but they can also show up at times you wouldn't expect. We've had downy mildew show up six to eight weeks earlier than it used to as we have warmer weather. And that makes it very difficult to control. And actually it's, it's probably the one that's, the, the divergence between what we can accomplish and what people who are willing to use very toxic substances can, can accomplish is very great. They can really basically kill all the life on the leaf, including the disease. We never can kill all the life. Our systems are totally dependent on light. So we have to use four different pieces, bring them together in order to have the control we need. These four pieces brought together in synergy are the tools we want you to have. So as you go into your season and the scary big guys out there, whether they be late blight, downy mildew, Phytophthora, capsici, which is a one that rots out the roots of peppers and stuff like that. You want to have the tools so that you are not paralyzed and don't give up when diseases hit. And normally organic growers think they don't have anything to control that. We do have tools. I can't guarantee you that you'll stop the disease, but we can usually guarantee that you'll get a crop. We need to rely, number one, on soil fertility. How healthy the plant is, how strong the plant's immune system is critical. Number two, we need to have the genetics. We need to have the genetics of the plants to be disease resistant. Then we're going to need to have the proper cultural methods. If we don't have the proper cultural methods, and this one's huge, okay? This is the culture of agriculture, getting to know your neighbors and finding out from them what's coming down the pike, you know? Part of it's the early alert system, you know, so that neighbors let each other know that, hey, there's disease here, and this extends all the way up now to where there are websites from extension and stuff that'll tell you that the disease is coming. There's actually a map you can follow the course of downy mildew coming at us. These kind of things are the culture, okay? And so fertility, genetics, culture, huge. And then finally, last for us and least effective, but yet we still have more and more tools are gonna be our sprays. The actual tools we use, the fungicides, and in a big way now we're using light, the compost tea, to get control. Oh far away from our growing area, do we need to try to <clears throat> eliminate dock? Is it? As far as possible. <laughs> just, as, just start going and, and go. Right? Eliminate what? 100 feet? Um, you know, feet? it's just, it's best just practice to get it rid of everywhere you see it. And it's just something you can do. It's not an insurance policy because you can't go on your neighbor's land and eradicate their dock, you know? You just, what you'll do by doing this is you won't eliminate the chance of getting it, but you won't get it you know, at times when it's marginal whether or not you get it, you know, when yeah. it's not that hot and humid, you know. And that gives you more time to get your plants bigger and stronger, you know. And I, I mean, you know, it's, it, we will get to, to beets again when we talk about um, disease resistant varieties. That really is the best solution for getting a crop. Um, but it doesn't mean that you don't want to try to do the other things to control it too. You know? mm -hmm. Because the disease resistance does not mean impregnable. And if it's a bad enough time, you know, you can't do it. We really don't even try to grow beets here during the heat of the summer. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, there are farms around that can grow them all year round around here and they do great, you know. And it's got to do with how much disease pressure there is. And does the Cercospora affect any other vegetables? There is Cercospora that attacks carrots, but it may very well be a different uh, species, you know, so they, they tend to be really specific, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. they tend not to, you know, diseases tend not to be like, you know, there's often area that gets broccoli, tomatoes, carrots, uh -huh. it's different often area for each one. Uh -huh. It's not the same often area. Hmm. You know. But it's a similar disease, it's classified the same, it's got, the, it's got similar, as they would say in the, the police shows, MODs, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> it does things the same way, it needs the same, they need the same conditions, you deal with them the same way, usually even the same sprays work. But not always. Yeah. Okay, so get, getting that you know this is a huge problem for us. You know, it's, it's one of the harder ones to control, and that we can lose the the crop like that. I mean, a couple of years ago, Debbie Roos posted an email that somebody had taken pictures of downy mildew attacking their cucumber field as a farm, right? 
And as they said, you know, they showed a video, it was a video, right? It almost looked like the farm was on fire. Because over the course of a few hours, the field was just turning brown. That's how fast some of these diseases can spread when conditions are perfect. And conditions are perfect usually when it's not sunny and it's humid. That's usually, you know, there's some weird diseases that have slightly different MODs, but, you know, um, that's the main one. Uh, okay, so given that, and as organic growers, right, we always go back to the basics, right? The bottom line is, to quote my good friend Wade at Troy, he probably gets quoted pretty often in these talks, right? Um, Nobody's spraying the forest, you know? and yet the forest is by and large really healthy. You see little patches of disease here and there, but by and large, everybody's really healthy. You know, the disease, you know, it's important to get that much as diseases drive us nuts, they have a function too or they wouldn't be around. You know? And their function is to ensure the rapid decomposition of things. As things are losing vitality, right, they've got to go down fast so the new stuff can come in. And so diseases take things down fast. Yeah. It's also they fill niches. If there's, a place, if there's a situation where there's an absence of life, diseases have specialized in occupying disturbed areas yeah. and taking advantage. They're, they're, you know, they're opportunists. So they're going to take advantage of situations where other life does not do well. Um, and that, that really pertains to soil-borne diseases. If you don't have a really vital, lively um, soil, soil flora and fauna, then what moves in first is the diseases. And then as, as the soil comes back into balance, other plants, other, other forms of life can move back in and recreate balance. But the diseases are actually there, making sure that there's life there. Um, and so it's a boom-bust, they tend to be boom-bust kind of organisms. And that's why, why oftentimes, and I, I'm just curious, you, you all grow pretty much organically probably, right? How many people have, have much problem with soil, soil-borne diseases, diseases that make your plants sick by infection through the soil? Okay, and what, uh, what's the disease you get? Uh, totally lost our, our, all of our raspberries two years ago. To Phytophthora cinnamome? Uh, I haven't had it diagnosed, but it's, uh, I'm sure it's a soil-borne something I, I was I had not identified it yeah you want to identify it absolutely that doesn't because even top of cinnamome you do not want to plant there again and you never want to walk into that soil and walk into the rest of your garden because mm -hmm. it is transferred by moving moving the soil around mm -hmm. and it's it is in the top 10 by the USDA DA of worst invasive um, diseases and it attacks Phytophthora cinnamome. What does it attack? It is, uh, it is the same family as late blight, late blight. And it is as virulent as late blight. And there's also Phytophthora capsici, which is, and I'm probably mispronouncing the last ones on these. I'm no good at Latin. But that's close, anyways. If you Google, you get it right. Um, and that one attacks peppers and squash, eggplant, things like that. That's spread oftentimes by floods. Yeah. But Phytophthora cinnamome, the only real controls are organic. Basically, heavy mulching with wood can help to control it. It, it develops an enzyme to digest the wood that also digests the, cell, the um, cellulose and the disease. I think it's the cellulose. Anyways, and then there's another function too. Two different ways that the wood functions to create biocontrols. The problem is it controls it. It doesn't eliminate it. And the danger is you walk into that field to pick raspberries and then you walk into your um, gorgeous landscape front yard and it attacks 900 woody perennials, guess what? Most of the guys in your front yard are susceptible. You know? So you really want to, you do want to ID it because then if you yeah. know what it is, you can take appropriate measures. But what's the best way to ID it? You, you, you to get a state? sample and now you got a tough row to hoe. Actually, you're going to have to plant another plant and have it get sick. Because uh -huh. you got to take them a live specimen. They can't, they don't ID it from the soil. Okay. You, oh. know? Mm -hmm. you can't ID them yourself, then you need to get them to the extension let them know that you want it to go to Raleigh. If they can't ID it, then you'll pay the fee and get it get it ID'd. Because if you don't know the disease, you're just nowhere. You haven't got, you're not even started. You, know? um, you have no chance of controlling it. Okay, so as far as cultural practices go, which is the way we do it if we're organic, right? First thing off is to maximize your fertility. Make sure your soil is balanced in minerals. You know, test it. 
get a soil test. If you don't understand soil test, um, our upcoming June workshop is going to have Dr. Mark Schoenbeck here, and he is really excellent at analyzing soil tests. Mm -hmm. um, and we will be analyzing soil test and, wa and wa waste analysis, the way you test compost and feedstocks for compost. But we'll John Nilsson here too, and we'll really be showing you how to really use your soil test. And Mark will be talking about how to use it in conjunction with co di cover cropping dynamically to really maximize your fertility. So that should be a spectacular workshop. I highly recommend it. Um, but if you if you don't know how to test it, to interpret it right now, extension can help you too. We tend to vary a little bit with extension on some things. Um, they don't put much of an emphasis on being sure to use high cal lime. Uh, we tend to think that it's real important not to get out of balance with magnesium and calcium. And for some reason, and maybe it's cheaper, dolomitic lime is the common lime, and it's just not good. If you already have plenty of magnesium in your soil, you should be using high cal lime. And so there are slight variations, so I tend to you know, prefer the way people like Dr. Schoenbeck um, analyze their test to the, the, to the one that I get from extension. But they're excellent too. I don't mean at all to diss them. It's just a difference of philosophy and I have this philosophy. You know? um, so either way, get a, get a test and start looking at, you know, making sure you have your minerals in balance. You know, you, you will look at your soil test. You'll, you'll learn how to see that, you know, oh, I'm low in potassium. I'm low in phosphorus. You know, these have specific impacts. Calcium is a huge one for disease resistance. And if the plants are stressed because they don't have their nutrition, Stress is what sets them up for disease. You know. My favorite example of that is, and you know, I didn't put this in here, but it's probably one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is don't buy your plants at the box stores. And the reason is, I just walked by Food Line, and all their plants were 25 cents, and they obviously had been desperately wilted. Desperately wilted. They're not hired. You know, the people employed there are not employed as plant caretakers. It's a seasonal thing they do, and they have huge amounts of plants to water on a pavement in the springtime and there's no leaves and the wind is blowing and they got a million customers bothering them. It's not their fault. But what happens, those plants wilt down horribly and you know they come back. They water them, they come back. They, you know, I guarantee you that some of the plants that get bought there have been wilted three or four times. You know, And they come back because plants are tough, right? But every time they're stressed like that, they're more susceptible to disease. It's just like if you were totally battered, if you were thrown in a concentration camp and then put in New York City, your odds of not catching something would be poor. You know, whereas everybody else walking around you would be doing, doing a whole lot better. You had just been to the ringer like these plants are. You know? And so, I just say, don't buy them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and other examples of that is, uh, sudden, sudden oak wilt was imported to North Carolina, thank you Lowe's, on rhododendrons. Do we need rhododendrons shipped from Oregon to North Carolina? <laughs> I kind of question that one. <laughs> Just be wary, and indeed, Walmart sold um, the um, girlfriend of one of our employees, Marshall, a, a, a grape, and he brought it to us to see what was wrong with it, and it was like, let's get this out of here. We looked it up, it was oak, Oak's um, uh, let's see, leaf scorch, I think, and highly transmissible by, by leaf hoppers. And it was here for like two days before I saw it, and I'm starting to see some weird stuff going on with some raspberry plants in the greenhouse, you know. Be real careful. You know, if you got a question and somebody else thinks you think somebody else might be able to help you with the disease, ask them if they'll look at it and maybe meet them someplace besides their farm. You know? <laughs> Do not move disease around. Go to extension. They're used to it. They know how to deal with it. You know, but you know, be careful about not moving disease. Usually that doesn't matter. Most diseases that we struggle struggle with are endemic. They're just here. There's not much we can do about it, but. Sometimes you could be the one that you know gives somebody a huge problem. So be real conscious. You know, um, I'll get into that more later on when I talk about um, uh, garden sanitation and stuff. But for right now, that's that's enough problem. Emphasizing active carbon is real important. That's like cover crops. Okay, dynamic use of compost. A lot of us really overuse compost. We get carried away with it, and it's easy to. I mean, you have to if you're just starting in a garden that's like really low, low organic matter and it's fine to do it then if you've done a soil test. Where you get in trouble is if you're putting tons of compost in and you already have high or medium high phosphorus and potassium levels. They're usually the ones that you get in trouble with. I mean, there could be other ones. The problem is compost is loaded with nutrients, right? Less so nitrogen, which a lot of people are counting on the compost to give their nitrogen and that's really not a good way to go. 
because to get enough nitrogen, you have to give way more compost than you need for phosphorus and potassium. The way to approach compost, in my mind, is to make sure you have very good compost by either making it yourself. We just gave a workshop on that, and we'll have a video for that um, eventually that we'll have online from that workshop, or come back to another workshop we give. But make very good compost, okay, age it, okay, that you can actually test it. You can get a waste analysis, and that can tell you what the CN ratio is. That'll tell you how well it broke down. You want a CN ratio below 15. You also can smell it, right? You can smell good compost. And bad compost, by the way, it sits long enough, it becomes good compost. But it has to sit a long time. It doesn't mean it won't have weed seeds in it. It doesn't mean there won't be some of the more um, long-lived diseases in it, but it'll be good as far as how it nourishes your soil. Because nature fixes everything. As long as it doesn't sit wet in a dark place or something, you know, or wet, wet a lot so it goes anaerobic all the time, it will eventually get fixed by things like worms and stuff like that. But if you make good compost in the first place, or by a good brand of compost, and the only one actually that I can recommend that's a bagged one is the Mackinac. And um, that's because John Nielsen taught him how to make it, and he troubleshoots it, so when they mess up, he helps them fix it, you know. So it's, it's reliably good. Um, if you can't get that, uh, you can still get some value from things like mushroom compost and black cow, but you really want to use those in small amounts, not lots, because they tend to really be um, cut with things like pine bark and stuff. Um, and so you just get it, you're using that for the microbial activity. The other thing is get a worm box going. Get the dynamism from the worm box. Use the dynamism from your compost and your worm castings with your cover crops. Put it in with your cover crops. When you put compost in with cover crops, right, it multiplies the value of the compost by a factor of 10. Because there's all that food for that wonderful life to immediately use, you know. And actually, something is going to eat that food. That's why when we till, we get a huge burst of growth. Sometimes it runs out of steam real fast, though. Because what happens is you put tons of oxygen in the soil and chopped up everything really fine. And guess what bacteria like? Tons of oxygen and small stuff, you know. And so they go crazy. If you have the life on the compost going in and try to work the soil no more than you have to, so that you're favoring the, the life that you want to favor, the life that's going to preserve or carbon and make sure you have lots of active carbon, then your soil is going to be more vital. We're experimenting a lot with low-till techniques now, with just mowing, killing cover crops and planting through it, using a starter mix that's got some compost mixed in it, and mixing that into the immediate area of the soil. And so, laying it right down on what you mow down? Well, yeah. Well, we, we, make a, well, we make some kind of hole still. You can't really plant in on top of the, on the cover crop, but right through the cover crop, yeah. And that means that the carbon is very slowly working into the soil and is very active. And active carbon is really what the soil loves. That's, you know, that's how the system works, right? The prairies, the tons of roots produced, tons of tops dying, right? The forest, leaves, and all that stuff falling all the time. The soil is used to active carbon. You know, that's how it works. And we've developed systems where really by overtilling and using high salt fertilizers, we're just wiping out the carbon. And we're having to rely on systems that are not um, dynamic, but rather, you know, the, the fertilizer has to hit the roots. You know, if it doesn't hit the roots, the plant doesn't grow.